Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention by Manning Maribel. No one has made more sacrifices to realize the completion of this work than Leith Mullings. For more than a decade, she has been my constant companion and intellectual compass as I have attempted to reconstruct the past. This work is hers. Malcolm X, copyright 2011. Prologue, Life Beyond the Legend. In the early years of the last century, the neighborhood just north of Harlem, later to be named Washington Heights, was a sparsely settled suburb. Only the vision of a businessman, William Fox, led to the construction of an opulent entertainment center on Broadway between West 165th and 166th Streets. Fox's instruction to the architect, Thomas W. Lamb, was to design a building more splendid than any theater on Broadway. By the time all was finished, in 1912, an expensive terracotta facade adorned the front walls, marble columns stood guard at the entrance, while carvings of exotic birds graced the foyer. It was these colorful motifs, inspired by the great 19th century artist John James Audubon, that prompted Fox to name his pleasure palace the Audubon. On the building's first floor, Lamb designed a massive cinema, large enough to seat 2,300 people. In subsequent years, the second floor was reserved for two spacious ballrooms, the Rose Ballroom, which could accommodate 800 patrons, and the larger Grand Ballroom, holding up to 1,500. Within a few decades, the neighborhood around the Autobahn began to change, becoming increasingly black and working class. The Autobahn's management catered to this new clientele by booking the most celebrated swing bands of the era, including Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and Chick Webb. The Autobahn also became the home for many of the city's militant trade unionists, and from 1934 to 1937, the newly formed Transport Workers Union held its meeting there, accompanied by the occasional violent confrontation. One night, in September 1929, for example, a 400-strong party sponsored by the Lantern Athletic Club was disrupted by four gunshots. Two people were badly wounded. During World War II, the Autobahn was rented out for weddings, bar mitzvahs, political meetings, and graduation parties. After 1945, however, the neighborhood changed yet again as many white middle-class residents sold their properties and fled to the suburbs. Columbia University's decision to expand its hospital at West 168th Street and Broadway into a major health sciences campus generated hundreds of new jobs for the black influx, while the Autobahn adapted to economic realities by shutting down its cinema and subdividing the space it had occupied into rentals. However, both the Rolls and Grand Ballrooms remained. By the mid-1960s, the building had surrendered most of its original grandeur. The main entrance for the ballrooms was small and drab. Customers had to climb a steep flight of stairs to the second-floor foyer, then maneuver past the manager's office and on into either the Rolls at the building's left or east side or the Grand, which faced Broadway. The larger room was about 180 feet by 60 feet, its north, east, and west walls housing about 65 separate booths, each of which could hold up to 12 people. Farthest from the building's main entrance along the south wall was a modest wooden stage, behind which was a cramped, poorly lit antechamber where musicians and speakers would muster before walking out to perform. On the winter afternoon of Sunday, February 21, 1965, the Grand Ballroom had been reserved by the controversial Organization of Afro-American Unity, OAAU, a Harlem-based political group. For nearly a year, the Autobahn's management had been renting the ballroom to the group, but it remained concerned about its leader, Malcolm X. About ten years before, he had arrived as the minister of Temple No. 7, the local headquarters for a militant Islamic sect, the Lost Foundation of Islam. 
NOI, later commonly described in the press as black Muslims. Its members preached that whites were devils and the black Americans were the lost Asiatic tribe of Shabazz, forced into slavery in America's racial wilderness. The road to salvation required converts to reject their slave surnames, replacing them with the letter X, the symbol that represented the unknown. Members were told that after years of personal dedication and spiritual growth, they would be given original surnames in harmony with their true Asiatic identities. As the nation's most public spokesman, Malcolm X gained notoriety for his provocative criticisms of both civil rights leaders and white politicians. The previous March, Malcolm X had announced his independence from the Nation of Islam. He quickly established his own spiritual group, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, MMI, largely for those NOI members who had left the nation in sympathy with him. Despite his break, he continued to make highly controversial statements. Quote, there will be more violence than ever this year. End quote. He predicted to a New York Times reporter in March 1964, for instance. The whites had better understand this while there is time. The Negroes at the mass level are ready to act. The New York City Police Commissioner responded to this prediction by labeling Malcolm, quote, another self-proclaimed leader who openly advocates bloodshed and armed revolt and sneers at the sincere efforts of reasonable men to resolve the problem of equal rights by proper, peaceful, and legitimate means. Malcolm was not intimidated by the attack. Quote, the greatest compliment anyone can pay me, he responded, is to say I'm irresponsible because by responsible they mean Negroes who are responsible to white authorities. Negro Uncle Toms. Several weeks later, Malcolm X appeared to experience a spiritual epiphany. In April, he visited the holy city of Mecca on a spiritual hajj and on returning to the United States declared that he had converted to Orthodox Sunni Islam, reputing his links to both the Nation of Islam and its leader, Elijah Muhammad. He announced his opposition to all forms of bigotry. He was now eager to cooperate with civil rights groups, he said, and to work with any white who genuinely supported black Americans. But despite these avowals, he continued to make controversial statements. For example, urging blacks to start gun clubs to protect their families against racists and condemning the presidential candidates of the major parties, Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater as providing no real choice for blacks. Most OAAU programs were choreographed as educational forums for the local community, encouraging audience participation. For the February 21st meeting, the featured speaker was Milton Gallimson, a prominent Presbyterian minister who had organized protests against substandard schools in New York City's black and Latino neighborhoods. The OAAU had not directly participated, but Malcolm had publicly raised the minister's efforts, and his lieutenants may have desired an informal alliance. Although the afternoon's program had been advertised to begin at 2, by the starting time barely 40 people had passed through the main entrance. The sparse early turnout may have been a reaction to fears of possible violence. For months, the nation had been engaged in a well-publicized feud with its former national spokesman, and Malcolm's followers in Harlem and other cities had been physically assaulted. Only a week earlier, his own home, located in the quiet neighborhood of Elmhurst, Queens, had been firebombed in the middle of the night. To guard against a public confrontation, the NYPD had assigned a detachment of up to two dozen officers at OAAU rallies whenever held at the Autobahn. One or more policemen, usually including the day's detail commander, would be stationed on the second floor in the business office, where they would have an uninterrupted view of everyone entering the main ballroom. Many of the others were prominently stationed at the main entrance or located outside, directly across the street in a small playground area residents called Pigeon Park. On this particular afternoon, however, not a single officer was at the Audubon entrance, and only one, briefly, was stationed in the park. 
No one was seen inside the business office. In fact, just two ununiformed patrolmen were placed inside the building, both having been ordered to remain in the smaller and, but for them, unoccupied Rolls Ballroom at a considerable distance from the featured event. The absence of a substantial police presence would prove critical, because earlier that morning five men who had been planning for months to assassinate Malcolm X met together one final time. Although the venue of that meeting was in Patterson, New Jersey, all five were members of the New York Mosque of the Nation of Islam. Only one conspirator was an official of the mosque. The others were NOI laborers and assumed that their actions had been approved by the nation's leadership. After meeting at the home of one of the conspirators, where they went over each man's assignment one final time, the five men then got into a Cadillac and headed for the George Washington Bridge. They exited in Upper Manhattan and found a parking spot close to the Autobahn that would also provide quick access back to the bridge and an easy escape to New Jersey. The sole security force inside the Grand Ballroom and at the main entrance was about 20 of Malcolm's followers. The head of Malcolm's security team was his personal bodyguard, Reuben X. Francis, who earlier that afternoon had told William 64 X. George that the day's team would be undermanned and that he would need his help. Usually, the dependable William would stand next to the speaker's podium, placed directly in the front center of the stage, where he could view the entire audience. On this particular day, however, Reuben instructed him to stand at the front entrance, about as far as he could have been from the stage. Reuben also delegated some decisions to the event security coordinator, John D. X., whose job was to supervise guards around the Grand Ballroom's perimeter. The normal protocol was for security teams to stand for up to 30 minutes, a demanding assignment, especially for those with no prior experience in policing crowds. Usually the most important positions went to former NOI members, all of whom had both security experience and martial arts training. If a known NOI sympathizer attempted to enter an event, he was to be questioned quietly but firmly. Nation of Islam members who had personal histories of violence or were known for hostility toward Malcolm would be escorted from the building. One such man was Linwood X. Cathcart, a former member of Malcolm's Mosque No. 7, who had recently joined the Jersey City Mosque. He had entered the Autobahn at 145 and seated himself in the front row of wooden folding chairs that had been placed across the dance floor. Malcolm's team spotted him at once, reckoning that his presence could mean trouble. Cathcart now brazenly wore an NOI pin on his suit lapel. Reuben persuaded him to go with him to the rear of the ballroom where, after exchanging words, he insisted that he remove the offending button if he wished to remain. Cathcart complied and returned to his seat. Malcolm's security people would later insist that he was the sole NOI loyalist they had spotted. Handling the necessary custodial duties that afternoon was Anas M. Luckman, Langston Hughes Savage, another NOI member who had severed ties with the nation out of loyalty to Malcolm. In his subsequent grand jury testimony, Luckman placed his arrival time at around 1.20. He briefly talked with a few people and, as he had done many times before, arranged the chairs on stage, positioned the speaker's podium, and removed some surplus equipment. He then, quote, went out into the audience and just stood around until the meeting started. Sometime after two, he decided to recheck the doors located at stage right, closest to the speaker's platform. For whatever reason, they were unlocked, which troubled him. But instead of notifying Malcolm's security people, he returned to his seat. Despite the recent firebombing and the escalating threats of violence, Malcolm had insisted that none of his security team, with the sole exception of Reuben, should carry arms that Sunday. At an OAAU meeting some evenings before, his orders had been vigorously challenged. 
Malcolm's chief of staff, James 67X Warden, was convinced that the failure to tighten security that afternoon almost certainly would invite trouble, as he later explained his actions. We wanted to check for weapons, but this was an OAAU public meeting. Malcolm said these people are not accustomed to having anybody search them. We're dealing with an entirely different group. As a result, as people entered the Autobahn, many wearing bulky winter coats, no one was stopped. If Reuben was worried by this, he didn't appear so, and even left the ballroom to pay the manager that afternoon's $150 fee. By this time, all the would-be assassins had entered the building. As they anticipated, no one searched them for weapons. The group then split up. The three designated shooters found chairs in the front row, either in front of or to the left of the speaker's podium. One shooter, a heavy-set, dark-complexioned man in his mid-twenties, was to deliver the initial hit. Two others were carrying handguns. Their task was to finish off Malcolm after the initial shots. The final two conspirators sat next to each other on the wooden chairs about seven rows back from the stage. Their assignment was to create a diversion. If possible, one of them was going to ignite a smoke bomb. By 2.30 p.m., the audience had grown to over 200, and they were becoming impatient. Benjamin 2X Goodman, Malcolm's assistant minister of Muslim Mosque Incorporated, came on stage and began a 30-minute warm-up. Because Benjamin was not among the featured speakers, most people continued talking or wandered about seeing friends. After about 10 minutes, Benjamin's remarks began to attract attention, as he recalled recent themes in Malcolm's rally speeches, such as opposition to the Vietnam War. Everyone knew that Malcolm almost always came to the podium immediately following Benjamin's introductions. Several minutes before 3 p.m., Benjamin was still exhorting the audience when, without a warning, a tall, sandy-haired man walked briskly out and sat on a chair a few feet from the podium. Caught off guard by his leader's entrance, Benjamin hastily finished up his remarks, then turned to sit down on one of the folding chairs on stage. As a rule, for safety reasons, Malcolm was not permitted to be there alone. On this occasion, however, he stopped his colleague from sitting, whispering instructions into his ear. Looking puzzled, Benjamin stepped down and returned to the backstage room. Assalamu alaikum, Malcolm proclaimed, extending the traditional Arabic greeting. Walaikum salam, hundreds chanted back. But before he could say anything further, there was an unexpected disturbance about six or seven rows back from the center stage. Get your hands out of my pockets, a man shouted to the person next to him. Both men stood up and began to tussle, diverting everyone's attention. From the stage, Malcolm yelled out, Hold it, hold it! The two principal rostrum guards, Charles X. Blackwell and Robert 35 X. Smith, scrambled to break up the men. Most of their colleagues also moved from their positions to quell the disruption, leaving Malcolm completely alone on stage. It was then that the conspirator in the first row stood up and walked briskly toward the rostrum. Beneath his winter coat, he cradled a sawed-off shotgun. About 15 feet from the stage, he stopped, pulled back his coat, and lifted his weapon. For many African Americans, February 21, 1965 is engraved in their memory as profoundly as the assassinations of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr., or for other Americans. In the turbulent aftermath of his death, Malcolm X's disciples embraced the slogan, Black Power, and elevated him to secular sainthood. By the late 1960s, he had come to embody the very ideal of blackness for an entire generation. Like W.E.B. Du Bois, Richard Wright, and James Baldwin, he had denounced the psychological and social cost that racism had imposed upon his people. He was also widely admired as a man of uncompromising action, the polar opposite of the nonviolent, middle class oriented Negro leadership that had dominated the civil rights movement before him. 
The leader most closely linked to Malcolm in life and death was, of course, King. However, despite having spent much of his early life in urban Atlanta, King was rarely identified as a representative of ghetto blacks. In the decades following his assassination, he became associated with images of the largely rural and small town south. Malcolm, conversely, was a product of the modern ghetto. The emotional rage he expressed was a reaction to racism in its urban context. Segregated urban schools, substandard housing, high infant mortality rates, drugs, and crime. Since by the 1960s, the overwhelming majority of African Americans lived in large cities, the conditions that defined their existence were more closely linked to what Malcolm spoke about than what King represented. Consequently, he was able to establish a strong audience among urban blacks who perceived passive resistance as an insufficient tool for dismantling institutional racism. Malcolm's latter-day metamorphosis from angry black militant into a multicultural American icon was the product of the extraordinary success of the autobiography of Malcolm X, co-authored by the writer Alex Haley and released nine months after the assassination. A bestseller in its initial years of publication, the book soon established itself as a standard text in hundreds of college and university curricula. By the late 1960s, an entire generation of African American poets and writers were producing a seemingly endless body of work paying homage to their fallen idol. In their imagination, Malcolm's image became permanently frozen, always displaying a broad, somewhat mischievous smile spotlessly well attired and devoted to advancing the interests and aspirations of his people. From the moment of his murder, widely different groups, including Trotskyists, black cultural nationalists, and Sunni Muslims claimed him. Hundreds of institutions and neighborhood clubs were renamed to honor the man whom actor Ozzie Davis had eulogized as our manhood, our living black manhood. A Malcolm X association was initiated by African Americans in the military. In Harlem, activists formed a Malcolm X Democrat Club. In 1968, the independent film producer Marvin Wirth hired James Baldwin to write a screenplay based on the autobiography, a project the novelist described as My Confession. It's the story of any black cat in this curious place and time. By the early 1970s, Betty Shabazz, Malcolm X's wife, was invited as an honored guest to a Washington, D.C. fundraising gala promoting the re-election of Richard Nixon. The renaissance of Malcolm X's popularity in the early 90s was largely due to the rise of the hip-hop nation. In the group Public Enemy's video, Shut Em Down, for example, the image of Malcolm is imposed over the face of George Washington on the U.S. dollar bill. Another hip-hop group, Gangstar, placed a portrait of Malcolm on the cover of one of its CDs. Political conservatives also continued their attempts to assimilate him into their pantheon. In the aftermath of the 1992 Los Angeles race riots, for instance, Vice President Dan Quayle declared that he had acquired important insights into the reasons for such unrest by reading Malcolm's autobiography, an epiphany most African Americans viewed as absurd, with filmmaker Spike Lee quipping, every time Malcolm X talked about blue-eyed devils, Quayle should think he's talking about him. With the release of Lee's three-hour biographical film, X, that same year, Malcolm reached a new generation. In a 1992 poll, 84% of African Americans between the ages of 15 and 24 described him as a hero for black Americans today. After years of relegating him to the periphery of modern black history, historians now begin to see him as a central figure. He had become an integral part of the scaffolding that supports a contemporary African-American identity, historian Gerald Horn wrote. His fascination with music and dance and nightclubs undergirded his bond with blacks. In 
For many whites, however, his appeal was located in his conversion from militant black separatism to what might be described as multicultural universalism. His assimilation into the American mainstream occurred, ironically, at Harlem's Apollo Theater on January 20th, 1999, when the United States Post Service celebrated the release of a Malcolm X stamp there. In a press statement accompanying the stamp's issuance, the U.S. Postal Service claimed that, in the year prior to his assassination, Malcolm X had become an advocate of a more integrationalist solution to racial problems. A closer reading of the autobiography as well as the actual details of Malcolm's life reveals a more complicated history. Few of the book's reviewers appreciated that it was actually a joint endeavor, and particularly that Alex Haley, a retired 20-year veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard, had an agenda of his own. A liberal Republican, Haley held the Nation of Islam's racial separatism and religious extremism in contempt, but he was fascinated by the tortured tale of Malcolm's personal life. In 1963, the beginning of the collaboration of these two very different men, Malcolm had labored to present a tale of moral uplift, to praise the power of the nation's leader, Elijah Muhammad. After Malcolm's departure from the sect, he used his autobiography to explain his break from black separatism. Haley's purpose was quite different. For him, the autobiography was a cautionary tale about human waste and the tragedies produced by racial segregation. In many ways, the published book is more Haley's than its author's because Malcolm died in February 1965. He had no opportunity to revise major elements of what would become known as his political testament. My own curiosity about the autobiography began more than two decades ago when I was teaching it as part of a seminar on African-American political thought at Ohio State University. Among African-American leaders throughout history, Malcolm was unquestionably the most consummately political activist, a man who emphasized grassroots and particularly politics led by working class and poor blacks. Yet. The autobiography is virtually silent about his primary organization, the OAAU. Nowhere in the text does its agenda or its objectives appear. After years of research, I discovered that several chapters had been deleted prior to publication. Chapters that envisioned the construction of a united front of Negroes from a wide variety of political and social groups led by the black Muslims. According to Haley, the deletion had been at the author's request after his return from Mecca. That probably is true, but Malcolm had absolutely no input on Haley's decision to preface the autobiography with an introductory essay by New York Times journalist M.S. Handler, who had covered Malcolm extensively during previous years, nor on Haley's own rambling conclusion, which frames his subject firmly within mainstream civil rights respectability at the end of his life. A deeper reading of the text also reveals numerous inconsistencies in names, dates, and facts. As both a historian and an African American, I was fascinated. How much isn't true and how much hasn't been told? The search for historical evidence and factual truth was made even more complicated by the complex and varied layers of the subject's life. A master of public rhetoric, he could artfully recount tales about his life that were partially fiction, yet the stories resonated as true to most blacks who had encountered racism. From an early age, Malcolm Little, as he was born, had constructed multiple masks that distanced his inner self from the outside world. Years later, whether in a Massachusetts prison cell or traveling alone across the African continent during anti-colonial revolutions, he maintained the dual ability to anticipate the actions of others and to package himself to maximum effect. He acquired the subtle tools of an ethnographer, crafting his language to fit the cultural context of his diverse audiences. As a result, Different groups received his personality and his evolving message 
through their own particular lens. No matter the context, Malcolm exuded charm and a healthy sense of humor, placing ideological opponents off guard and allowing him to advance provocative and even outrageous arguments. Malcolm always assumed an approachable and intimate outward style, yet also held something in reserve. These layers of personality were even expressed as a series of different names, some of which he created, while others were bestowed upon him. Malcolm Little, Homeboy, Jack Carlton, Detroit Red, Big Red, Satan, Malachi Shabazz, Malik Shabazz, El Haj Malik El Shabazz. No single personality ever captured him fully. In this sense, his narrative is a brilliant series of reinventions, Malcolm X being just the best known. Like a great method actor, Malcolm drew generously from his background, so that over time, the distance between actual events and the public telling of them widened. After his death, other distortions, embellishments by devoted followers, friends, family members, and opponents turned his life into a legend. Malcolm was fascinating to many whites in a sensual, animalistic way, and journalists who regularly covered his speeches picked up a subdued yet unmistakable sexual subtext. M.S. Handler, whose home Malcolm visited for an interview in early March of 1964, attributed his aura of physical prowess to his politics. No man in our time aroused fear and hatred in the white man as did Malcolm, because in him the white man sensed an implacable foe who could not be had for any price, a man unreservedly committed to the cause of liberating the black man. Even Malcolm during his early years routinely employed evocative metaphors to describe his personality. For example, portraying his time in a Massachusetts prison in 1946, he likened his confinement to that of a trapped animal. I would pace for hours like a caged leopard, viciously cursing aloud. Eventually, the man in the cell block had a name for me, Satan. Handler's wife, who had been present when Malcolm had visited her home, admitted to her husband, You know, it was like having tea with a black panther. To black Americans, however, Malcolm's appeal was rooted in entirely different cultural imagery. What made him truly original was that he presented himself as the embodiment of the two central figures of African American folklore, simultaneously the hustler, trickster, and the preacher minister. Janice faced, the trickster is unpredictable, capable of outrageous transgressions. The minister saves souls, redeems shattered lives, and promises a new world. Malcolm was a committed student of black folk culture, and to make a political point, he would constantly mix animal stories, rural metaphors, and trickster tales. For example, refashioning the fox versus the wolf as Johnson vs. Goldwater. His speeches mesmerized audiences because he could orchestrate his themes into a narrative that promised ultimate salvation. He presented himself as an uncompromising man wholly dedicated to the empowerment of black people without regard to his own personal safety. Even those who rejected his politics recognized his sincerity. Obviously, the analogy between the actor as performer and the political leader as performer goes only so far, but the art of reinvention in politics does demand the selective rearrangement of a public figure's past lives and the elimination of embarrassing episodes, as Bill Clinton has taught us. In Malcolm's case, the memoirs written by friends and relatives have illustrated that the notorious outlaw Detroit Red character Malcolm presented in his autobiography is highly exaggerated. The actual criminal record of Malcolm Little for the years 1941 to 1946 supports the contention that he deliberately built up his criminal history, weaving elements of his past into an allegory documenting the destructive consequences of racism within the U.S. criminal justice and penal system. Self-invention 
was an effective way for him to reach the most marginalized sectors of the black community, giving justification to their hopes. My primary purpose in this book is to go beyond the legend, to recount what actually occurred in Malcolm's life. I also present the facts that Malcolm himself could not know, such as the extent of illegal FBI and New York Police Department surveillance and acts of disruption against him. The truth about those among his supporters who betrayed him politically and personally and the identification of those responsible for Malcolm's assassination. One of the greatest challenges I encountered in reconstructing his life was the attempt to examine his activities inside the Nation of Islam. Most popular treatments focus heavily on his public career during his final two years. Part of the problem in unearthing his earlier speeches and letters from the 1950s was that the current NOI leadership, headed by the former Louis X. Walcott, known today as Louis Farrakhan, had never permitted scholars to examine the sex archives. After years of effort, I was able to initiate a dialogue with the Nation of Islam. In May 2005, I sat with Farrakhan for an extraordinary nine-hour meeting. The Nation subsequently made available to me 50-year-old audio tapes of Malcolm's sermons and lectures delivered while he was still Mosque Number no. 7's leader, providing significant insights into his spiritual and political evolution. Veteran members also came forward to be interviewed, the most important of whom was Larry 4X Prescott, later known as Akbar Muhammad, a former assistant minister of Malcolm's who had sided with Elijah Muhammad during the sex split in March 1964. These sources presented a perspective that had not been adequately represented before, the views of the Nation of Islam and its adherents. Malcolm's journey of reinvention was in many ways centered on his lifelong quest to discern the meaning and substance of faith. As a prisoner, he embraced an anti-white, quasi-Islamic sect that nevertheless validated his fragmented sense of humanity and ethnic identity. But as he traveled across the world, Malcolm learned that Orthodox Islam was in many ways at odds with the racial stigmatization and intolerance at the center of the Nation of Islam's creed. Malcolm came to adopt true Islam's universalism and its belief that all could find Allah's grace regardless of race. Islam was also the spiritual platform from which he constructed a politics of third world revolution with striking parallels to the Argentinian guerrilla and co-leader of the 1959 Cuban revolution Che Guevara. It was also the political bridge that brought Malcolm into contact with the Islamic Brotherhood in Lebanon as well as in Egypt and Gaza with the Palestine Liberation Organization. Soliciting the support of the government of Gamal Abdel Nasser for his activities on behalf of Orthodox Islam in the United States may have made it necessary to adopt Nasser's political positions such as fierce opposition to Israel. There also remain many unresolved questions about Malcolm's death and what parties were responsible for the order to kill him. History is not a cold case investigation. I have had to weigh forensic probabilities, not certainties. Although in 1966, three NOI members were convicted of the murder, Extensive evidence suggests that two of those men were completely innocent of the crime, that both the FBI and the NYPD had advanced knowledge of it, and that the New York County District Attorney's Office may have cared more about protecting the identities of undercover police officers and informants than arresting the real killers. That the case has remained unsolved after more than 40 years helps place it in a special category in the annals of African American and U.S. history. Unlike the murders of Medgar Evers and Martin Luther King Jr., gunned down by lone white supremacists, or the killing of George Jackson, carried out by California prison guards, 
Malcolm was killed before a large audience in the heart of urban black America. In the rush to judgment, his death was attributed solely to the Nation of Islam. The media constructed image of Malcolm X as a dangerous demagogue made it impossible to conduct a thorough investigation of his death and it was only within black American communities that he was seen as a political martyr. It would take most of white America almost three decades to alter its perceptions. The great temptation for the biographer of an iconic figure is to portray him or her as a virtual saint without the normal contradictions and blemishes that all human beings have. I have devoted so many years in the effort to understand the interior personality and mind of Malcolm that this temptation disappeared long ago. He was a truly historical figure in the sense that more than any of his contemporaries he embodied the spirit, vitality, and political mood of an entire population, black urban mid-20th century America. He spoke with clarity, humor, and urgency, and black audiences both in the United States and throughout Africa responded enthusiastically. Even when he made controversial statement with which the majority of African Americans strongly disagreed, few questioned his sincerity and commitment. On the other hand, any comprehensive review of his public record reveals major mistakes of judgment including negotiations with the Ku Klux Klan. But unlike many other leaders, Malcolm had the courage to admit his mistakes and to seek out and apologize to those he had offended. Even when I have disagreed with him, I deeply admire the strength and integrity of his character and the love he obviously felt toward the African American people and their culture. To appreciate how Malcolm's resurrection occurred, first among African Americans and later throughout America, we need to reconstruct the full contours of his remarkable life, a story that begins in a small black community on the north side of Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs>